Welcome, aloha. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii, the difficult conversations to make good trouble that hopefully provoke thoughts and hopefully provoke conversations that help people see and make better choices. And to help us do that today, we have really, really good friend for a few years and just an eminently admired person in my book, Rob Frisch, who was one of the founders of Convergence Policy Group and is the author of a recent book. Uh, and rather than have me talk about Rob or the book, Rob, I'm going to let you do it. Tell us a little bit about you and your book and what you do and what Convergence is. Well, thanks, Chuck. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I am uh, from upstate New York originally, um, came to Washington after law school in 1975 in order to try to end poverty in America. And I spent a couple of decades trying to do that and eventually came to the conclusion that uh, for people working on big national issues in Washington, there wasn't a place for people to sit down who disagreed on how to solve problems, even though they agreed those problems needed to be solved. So. Uh, starting in 1998 and culminating in 2009, I began to work on creating what became Convergence Center for Policy Resolution, which is an organization that's, that's dedicated to convening people who are uh, those whose um, knowledge, experience, and influence is needed to solve problems. And so what Convergence does is convenes people across uh, po political and policy divisions on big national issues, and now increasingly on state issues and tries to find consensus solutions to issues of great importance to the public. So that's the essence of convergence. And I now um, have stepped down as CEO. I was CEO from 2009 to 2020, but I remain on the board and remain as an advisor to convergence. And I have a co-author who's the current CEO of convergence. Her name is Mariah Levison, and she's doing a wonderful job for convergence. Fantastic. So, hey, what is Convergence really trying to do? Who are they trying to do it with? And can you give us some examples of that? Uh, well, we broaden our horizons. And in fact, now we're creating a whole training arm and what we call a learning lab to help people learn, uh, become inspired and equipped to do collaborative problem solving. Convergence convenes leading uh, groups and individuals whose differences stand in the way of progress. So one of our flagship programs was on K through 12 education, and we convene leaders of teachers unions and charter school movements and private companies and school administrators to try to deal with all the differences people have about K through 12 education. And they came up with a vision that um, they're moving forward to help make sure we meet the needs of all children. Uh, they have a concept called learner-centered education. And now we've spun off an entirely new nonprofit that's moving those ideas out across the country with people from across the divides on education working together. Another example would be some work we did on incarceration, where we were dealing with the re-entry of ex-offenders into society, and we gathered people of all different stripes, including people from who are very critical of the prison systems, and people who work for prisons, uh, people from private prisons, and they had a wonderful uh, uh, experience over about a year and a half, where they came up with a series of ideas to help people thrive when they get out of prison. It was interesting because no matter what you think about um, prison sentences and who goes to jail, everyone's in, a, in agreement that once people are coming out, it's for the betterment of society if people can get jobs and have good health and not get reinvolved in the criminal justice system. And our project generated a whole series of ideas how to, how, about how to do that better. So basically what Convergence does is try to bring together people who are often in conflict about how to solve a problem even though they agree on what the problem is, and brings together those who are whose disagreement does stand in the way of progress, and more often than not finds major areas of common ground that people can work on together. Oh, what a wonderful example. Um, what, in your experience, in those groups in conflict, and they can be multiple groups, and the conflicts can be multifaceted, not just one side against the other, like the political parties, but who needs to be involved? What needs to happen in order for you to move that needle from divergence to convergence? Yeah, it's a great question, and it actually depends on the project. Um, some of the early things I worked on, in fact, just before convergence, I 
ran a project um, when I was incubating convergence on healthcare coverage. And that was clearly going to be a legislative agenda. And so at that point, we gathered all the major stakeholders, and this is in our book, From Conflict to Convergence, leaders of hospitals and insurers and pharmaceutical companies and consumer groups uh, and many more uh, uh, physicians. And we put them in a room because uh, this is back in 2004, because there were nearly 50 million people who didn't have health insurance. And all these people agreed that everyone should have health insurance, but everyone wanted their own idea how to do it. And that issue had been stuck. In fact, there was you know, a lot of difficulty during the Clinton administration when President Clinton tried to move a bill through that his, that then First Lady Hillary Clinton helped engineer, and it got caught into a big, huge national controversy and went nowhere. So we convened those groups, and they came together, and they ended up with a shared vision uh, for a design of how we could cover many more people uh, in, in the United States. The first step was to cover children. And then while the, uh, the group itself did not design the Affordable Care Act, some of the architecture of it was designed in our group. So in that case, it was a legislative issue, Chuck. In other cases, we find that the implementation might be more through private sector, through businesses, through changes in practices or public understanding. Uh, we did a project on economic mobility. And while we had legislative uh, recommendations, we had big companies like Walmart and McDonald's at the table. And in, in exchanges with people who were concerned about workers' rights and workers' ability to move up the scale, a series of ideas got generated, and those companies went ahead and implemented them. So in each case, it may be a little bit different uh, what the strategy is to affect change. And in the case of the education project I mentioned, it became a nonprofit that is working really ground um, from, the, from the ground floor up around the country, from the grassroots levels, to have these ideas be adopted. And in other cases, there's, there are legislative proposals that are still pending, or there are other initiatives that are underway based upon whatever the group thinks will move the ideas forward in the most uh, expeditious way. One of the things I'm hearing underneath what you're talking about is how do you get, especially in this toxically polarized time, how do you get the leaders of groups who believe that their concentrated power, wealth, leverage, whatever you want to call it, can be used any way they want that gains them advantage? And that's in their best interest to do that. How do you move that needle from power abuse to power sharing or even power distribution? Well, I may not agree with all the assumptions you put in there uh, about you know uh, the, the raw use of power by everybody, but the truth is that there are many issues that people need resolved, even if they have the power. And the fact that it loggerheads with other people mean that means that it doesn't move forward. When we did the healthcare project, I mentioned I was told by people that they've been stuck for decades, each arguing, each having their own point of view, and nobody was prevailing. So there's a need to convene all the people and to have them sort of push each other's thinking to a higher level. So that's one way to do it. If people are so frustrated with everything else they've tried, they can't get their way or they can't get it done. In other cases, sometimes we attract very high level people and people feel like, well, I better be at that table because I need to defend my interests. That was very, very much true on our education project. We had one woman who was a very fierce advocate for school choice, a big critic of teachers unions. And she said point blank, and this is in our book, that she had almost no confidence that some gab fest that we organized would do anything. But since the teachers unions are going to be at the table and she was afraid about what they would say about issues near and dear to her heart, she wanted to go in and defend her own interests. Well, eventually she and the teachers union, unions reached many areas of agreement. In fact, the current president of the NEA, who was a vice president then, Becky Pringle, and this other woman who's the uh, conservative advocate on, on uh, education, Giselle Huff, became good friends and even went on a speaking engagement together. So in that case, Giselle joined because she was afraid what might happen if she didn't come. What I'd say to you, Chuck, is that most people, even when you describe people concerned about power and just winning out, they're also citizens and they want to have they want to have problems solved. And if we can find a framing that is inviting to all different points of view so about an issue that they really want to have solved, then people will come to the table as long as there's a shared goal. 
And from there, we often develop some shared principles that will guide the decision making on what recommendations come out. But basically, almost one of the biggest challenges, which is what you hit it, is just to get people at the table. And if you can get people in the room, and then our process can take over to create a culture of trust and relationship that allows conversations to move forward in ways that they don't normally move forward when people are simply debating the issues and fighting about who's right and who's wrong and who's going to win and who's going to lose. That movement, and I appreciate your clarifying that what the question was trying to do was to say there are some people in society, some groups in society that engage in the abuse of power that operates at the expense of others in ways that those particular people in groups may feel is to their personal advantage or benefit. Okay, we that's true everywhere. It's not only in the US or in Europe or in South America or in Asia or wherever, but well, let me check if I can interrupt. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Did you want to, let me just tell you a quick story because I don't necessarily view it quite the same way. I might be a little naive, a little Pollyannish. When we did the project on healthcare, which, which I ran, I was the director, and this is before, just before I started Convergence. We pulled together the major pharmaceutical companies who many people view as inherently evil. And a very high level person from one of the largest pharmaceutical companies came to the table. He was quite senior. Um, and it became perhaps the most beloved guy in the room because he started the dialogue by saying, my company has interests about how we cover and uh, people who are uninsured and whether we cover them and what ways we cover them. But I want to set a tone in this room by saying that let's have a discussion about the best way to provide coverage for the over 40 million Americans who don't have coverage now. And let me worry about my company's interests later. Let's have an open conversation. So he may be exceptional, but we have found that you know when we get corporate leaders or other union leaders or people who are deeply powerful, that we put them in a room and they have shared goals and we create respect across differences, that people are able to drop their defenses and begin to look at solutions that work for them and for other people. And that's really been our experience over and over again at Convergence. And it was my co-author's experience, Mariah's experience in Minnesota, where she ran a state agency for many years. And we have found that even though we've only been close to the last few years, that our experiences of the last two decades have paralleled each other, that it's possible to create cultures of respect and have people come together to, to fight for shared goals that they all agree are better for their own interest and for the country as a whole. It's really helpful that you're able to articulate it that way because it addresses that stereotype, that image, that I tried to put into the question, not on the assumption that it's predominant, but it, that it's still enough of a problem, not only in some people who do it, but in the minds of people who are forming resistance to what they think that does. So what in your experience in doing these, what are some of the common values, the common priorities and interests that you found people who came into the room opposed in conflict, found, and that helped them converge. What was it that brought the people who do it for a living and for a profit and the people who were trying to advocate for those who don't get the benefit of any of that? In, in that case, for a lot of the companies, they would do better if more people were covered. So there'd be more people buying insurance, more people getting drug coverage and so on. And so there was a near interest to have more people be covered, but there was disagreement about, you know, is should the government do it? Should it be private sector? How does it get uh, put together? But they had a shared goal in that case. And many other instances, um, and that's part of our job as conveners is to try to find the sweet spot where people can work for a larger shared goal. It might even be just a generalization. We ought to have more economic mobility. The American dream ought to be more available to people. And you start with that, and then you begin to build out some principles. And we find that the process of getting to know each other, understanding people's backgrounds, understanding where they're coming from, understanding the underlying interests of each of the stakeholders allows, allows people to understand what needs to be, what needs of the stakeholders need to be met in the solutions. And again, um, most of these people are also citizens. So while some of them may uh, be, you know, 
be much more concerned about their raw power and profits. That's not our experience. That, in fact, uh, most of the corporate people we've worked with or other advocacy groups eventually come around to the view that they can find answers that work for them and potentially work for other people. And that's always been our goal, that underneath it all, there's some fundamental needs people want to meet. And most people do share that. And that's the other thing I was going to say, Chuck, is that we don't start by discussing the issues. We start by putting people through exercises where they learn what each other's values are. And more often than not, the values overlap. They just have difference of, differences of opinion about how to implement those values. But most people want better health care for everybody. Most people want economic opportunity. Most people want people getting out of jail not to be back into the prison system. Um, most people want long-term care for elderly and disabled people. Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to get there. So I, I believe there are larger shared values amongst most people, not everybody. There are extremes. There are people too unreasonable or too dishonest or too ideological to participate. But we often uh, always try to bring in people with the widest possible uh, range of views because we think that that pushes thinking to a higher level. People go back and forth and they share their ideas. And to the extent that we have already gathered people who aren't just in the middle, but are a little bit toward uh, each further to each side, and if they reach agreement, it's more likely to be a more durable agreement and probably a wiser agreement because we've had to contend with this wide range of views that we have at the table. One of the things that that seems to exemplify is your personal and convergences, and I'm sure Mariah's it as well, to the belief that human connections can elicit and evoke human values that can influence human perspectives and choices. That's kind of the connection, communication, value, perspective combination of interaction that I'm hearing here. Is that, am I missing something? No, that was really well said, Chuck. I mean, I think, and I, you know, I'm a veteran of Capitol Hill and fierce debates and trying to win and defeat the other side, working for, you know, one party or the other. I used to work for, um, uh, you know, one side when I was on the Hill. But the essence of what we do, which I think is groundbreaking, and of course, there are many mediators who now do that, as you well know, as you practice it yourself, is that we're very relational. That, in fact, it's in the building of trust, putting relationships ahead of being right in the moment, of understanding each other, of staying curious, of giving people the benefit of the doubt. That becomes the grist, if you will, the lubricant to allow people to talk in ways they can listen and hear each other differently and on find wide areas where they can agree, even if they continue to disagree. So, for instance, on our education project, you know, the leadership of the unions do not believe in school choice. So they think it undermines public education and other people in the room believed in school choice. But they came up with a series of elegant ideas which actually, uh, you know, avoided that question. They, did, they didn't resolve it. They remained in disagreement about it. But they found this notion of learner-centered learner education, which really is about meeting the needs of every child in a way that, that serves that child best, that they could rally around. So I would simply say that there are lots of different ways for us to, to, to get to um, uh, solutions, but it has to be centered, first of all, by building trust with those who are convening and building trust amongst those who think they're in disagreement. And having people see each other as whole human beings, not just as positions on a particular issue, but understand their thoughts and their desires, their needs, and what, what motivates them. And once you can get underneath that, um, you can really go places to find areas where uh, there can be agreement on how to move forward without compromising the principles of any uh, group in particular. Do you think that's possible in, let me throw out a couple that are fairly high priority right now and, and fairly polarized and intractable, at least at the moment, one being pro-life, pro-choice, abortion and reproductive choice, and the other being gun control and public safety and so-called Second yeah. Amendment rights. Yeah. Any way to make progress on those? Yeah, actually, I'm aware of progress made on both fronts, but maybe not exactly what you might expect. So many years ago, even before I uh, 
was in the starting convergence, I worked for a group called Search for Common Ground. And um, there was a woman there who I got to know quite well, ran a project uh, with people on both sides of the abortion issue. This was back when there was bombings of abortion clinics and people being oh. killed. So people- Was that the, Susan Ponziba? And it wasn't Susan, although she was, I think, involved in the in the work up in Massachusetts with right. um, with Laura Chazen. Um, ah, right. And I'm blanking now on my good friend's name. I'll, I'll have it in a moment. She's her, her mind's uh, her her face is on my mind. Um, and and what they did is they convened people first of all to help lower the temperature. They agreed they would never uh, reach full agreement on whether people had to, uh, women had the right to choose or not, whether there was a right to abortion or not. But they listened respectfully, and they began to understand that reasonable people could take different sides on that issue. And then in some instances, in some of these groups, they began to work on things they could agree on, like teenage pregnancy prevention, which would limit the, you know, limit the needs for abortion, or uh, uh, foster care and adoption policy, so that if people children are born, they're well taken care of. So there were areas where people could work together, form bonds, and at least lower the temperature, but they wouldn't necessarily um, you know, agree on the underlying issue, which is understandable. On guns, Convergence in the last couple of years did a project on guns and suicide. And we had to pick that carefully. Uh, we felt that taking on the issue of gun control per se was not necessarily a winning issue, but we were able to assemble a wonderful group of people who are both gun rights advocates and people very critical of guns in society and have a conversation about how deadly uh, the use of guns was in suicide. And what could we all do to prevent that? Everybody wanted that. No one wants to see life lost. And so they came up with a whole series of ideas about how to deal with mental health issues and safety issues and gun issues and formed a, formed a really nice relationship amongst people who had, would have never even talked to each other. I'll tell you one quick story on that, Chuck, if we have time. There's a woman who was at the table, this is in our book, who's a psychologist who teaches at George Washington University. And she also had been, I think, a, a both a, a, a pastor, and she used to counsel a lot of uh, black women who were involved uh, in um, having, you know, had been subjected to violence and so on. And um, so she's at this table, and she's never really, I think, held a gun. And she hadn't, even though she believes in dialogue, hadn't really met with gun rights people. And one day, there was a fellow, uh, who, uh, this, this is all on Zoom during the pandemic, who invited people to look at his camera and he had like a wall of guns up on the, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was dozens of guns up on the wall behind him and he was going through his collection and she's getting more and more horrified looking at this sort of burly uh, white man with lots of guns. And she finally says, you know, everyone's sort of eating up your presentation, but if you were a black man, people would probably respond differently. He said, no, you're right. And she said, you know, I don't get it. Why do you need to have all these guns? And then she was shocked by his answer. His answer had nothing to do with politics or anything else. He simply said, it's fun. It's fun for me to have these guns. It's fun for me to shoot these guns. And she'd never even thought about it that way. And so she, like others, had stereotyped this guy. He wasn't out to make a collection of guns so he could go out and murder a bunch of people or hurt people, as far as I know. I don't know the man. But, you know, it's in the book because she said, yeah, it opened her eyes to the fact that she never quite understand or know what motivates people. And that's why these conversations allow you to get underneath why people do the, what they do in life, allows you to see things differently and then provide opportunities to work together more effectively. And what a wonderful, perfect, vivid example of exactly that connection of, hey, humanity human c communication, connection, values, and perspectives hey, in ways where he helped her understand that, hey, my guns are to me what Venus Williams tennis rackets are to her. Yeah, yeah, well said. So what's ahead? What are your and Convergence's highest priorities going forward? Are there things on your plate now that are top priority? Well, my my personal priorities and convergences do overlap, but not completely. I'm now I'm you know on the board and semi-retired, but um, 
So first, Convergence will continue to convene people on really important conversations at the state and national levels, and occasionally on the local level, to help bridge differences through our methodology, but we can't do it alone. So one of the most exciting things going on at Convergence is we've launched something called the Learning Lab, and our book, Mariah's book, and my book together are part of that, which is an entire goal to inspire and equip people to be collaborative problem solvers in their lives, in their personal lives, and their professional lives. And, you know, it's my belief that if people could take the ability to communicate across differences and to collaborate effectively despite differences, that that could be taken to scale by business leaders who become collaborative leaders, by union leaders, by hospital leaders, by academic leaders, by people who uh, run houses, have uh, ministers and rabbis and congregations that are divided. If we could create a groundswell of people who begin to listen better, talk to each other, solve problems more effectively, we can begin, I think, hopefully, to shift the culture to re reduce polarization and reduce division. And there's nothing quite like it, Chuck. I mean, it's great. So many groups are working on this, and I'm thrilled about that. Many of them focus mainly on dialogue, so that people just get to know each other. And if you're from a, you know, if you're a red uh, your politics are red, your politics are, are blue. They just want to create understanding. We take it one step further where we actually have them work together to solve problems. And we find that to be an amazing, a bonding experience. And what happens is even after they're done with us, they often become friends. They work together differently. They speak to, to each other differently. Uh, it creates what we call these radiating impacts over time. In fact, then people sometimes come back to us to say, can you do another session? We got another issue. And so... We hope that this is a lesson for people uh, that they'll apply outside of our the confines of Convergence's work, that they can work together with people differently. And while I'm a bit, you know, probably grandiose about that, I would like to think that our book and the ideas we have, if and working with other people like you and many others who get this, uh, every, I think every therapist in the country gets this. Uh, we've been called family therapists for politics. If we collectively can begin to impress upon people, this isn't soft, this isn't naive, it isn't about kumbaya, it's about, it's hard-headed, it's proven, it actually works, that in developing relationships of trust and going deep and understanding each other's needs and interests and listening carefully to people and patiently to people, it's really possible to find wide areas of common ground and to create not only a more functional society, but a more civil society in the process. What a perfect way to say it and a perfect way to wrap us up for today. I wish we had more time and, and hours. For me as a 60s guy, to get to really see and hear and feel and share with all of you who view this, someone whose values, whose ideals are so passionately not only held, but shared and put into action with and for others in service. Rob, first, thank you and Mariah and Convergence for the example, the connection, and the ideals and values you share. Think Tech Hawaii, aloha, and thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.